All right, continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Jerry Grant. Jerry is the Director of Collections and Research at the Shaker Museum in Chatham, New York. He has worked in this role at the museum since 1987 and prior to that in a variety of inter interpretive and administrative jobs in Shaker Museums since the mid-1970s. He obtained his education at Michigan State University in History and Cultural Anthropology, Syracuse University, the State University of New York in Albany, and Columbia University in librarianship specializing in rare books and archives. Although he has published several books and a number of articles on the Shakers, he prefers to have his name in the acknowledgement pages over the title page of the books as he most enjoys uh, leading researchers through the complexities of research about the Shakers. Jerry has never spent any time tracing his own family tree, but delights in the stories about his family shared by his parents and grandparents. He will provide a short overview of Shaker history and the sex spiritual belief and practice, provide an overview of Shaker records and research, and will examine the thrust of Shaker research that uh, uses genealogical sources and tools. So I would like to welcome a warm virtual welcome to Jerry. Thank you, Suzanne. Am I on yet? Thank yes, you. You, yes, you are. Great. And one of the most exciting things I heard in your introduction, your pre-introduction, was you do a one-on-one -on -one genealogy lab, and I have a list of about 18,000 Shaker names, so I'll be calling on you every week for a while. <laughs> I think I'll let that one go. But um, anyway, welcome, and I'm delighted to be with you today and to share some information about the American Shakers and to talk about a subject about which I know very little, and that is genealogy but I can give you some hints about where the challenges might be and what um, I might be helpful or what the Shaker world in general might be helpful with you to do. So let me just start with the Shakers for a bit, just to get, because I'm assuming that all of you have heard the word and some of you may know a bit and some of you may not know enough um, to follow the rest of this. So, just to be just on the beginning, the Shakers came from England to the American colonies in 1774. They came like a lot of other people to escape persecution for their unconventional and totally unapproved religious beliefs and practices. At that point, the Shakers could have registered as a dissident religious group and won the protection of the crown, but they chose not to do that. And therefore they were persecuted in around Manchester where they first sprung up and um, eventually found it necessary to come to um, the colonies to, um, to have that religious freedom. They were never a group of more than 20 or 40 people while they were in England, and that number quickly dwindled when they made a plan to go to America. So in the end, they found a woman named Ann Lee and eight of her followers came to America on the ship Mariah, leaving from Liverpool in the month of May and arriving in New York Harbor on August um, 6, 1774. The Shakers were um, by practice, they were Protestant by practice, probably associated most likely with the Wesleyan Methodists, who were very popular and gaining converts in the area where they were. Um, and with their Methodist background and simplicity and plainness, they also took on the mantle of the, um, the earlier Quakers and their belief in pacifism and the Quaker-like openness to manifestations of the spirit um, in, led by their language, led by um, the spirit and their religious practice. Their, their openness to the manifestations of the spirit led the Shakers to erratic movements, much like the Quakers of old did, um, and eventually to more formalized organized dances, which they became very well known once they were established in the colony. The, um, a question about always comes up about the Shakers and the Quakers. Um, all of the research that we have done finds that there's little to no connection between the early Shakers and the early Quakers, except that they were led by the spirit in their, um, their desire to get up and move around and shake and quake. And an early Manchester correspondent, a newspaper correspondent, um, coined the phrase shaking Quakers when he first witnessed their erratic movements, and that name stuck. But then they got to shorten to Shakers, and the Shakers took up that name 
with some pride after they found out how many times David shook before the Lord as they went through the Bible looking for those references. Theologically, they tried to follow the example of the church that they believed was established by Jesus and Jesus as apostles. That is, they lived in a community of shared things, lived a celibate life so as to share their love universally, and were charged to serve the poor and the afflicted in mind and body. The Shaker's founder, as I mentioned, Anne Lee, was the daughter of a blacksmith from Manchester, England. Um, she was seen by her followers as holding the knowledge of the Christ spirit, uh, so, so, holding the knowledge of the Christ spirit was among all of us and needed to be tended by each individual in order to pre prepare for the judgment, for judgment and the eternal heavenly reward. The Shaker's belief that God was neither male nor female, or was both male and female, and the commitment to celibacy led them to create both a male and a female line of authority and manage the work of daily life. Although traditional gender roles, no women became blacksmiths. Um, men did not become cooks. In practice, beginning in the late 1780s, they organized themselves into communities comprised of separate communal families of 30 to 70 members, sometimes larger than that, calling themselves, calling each other brothers and sisters, and were directed and spiritually counseled by leaders referred to as elders and elders. Shaker life involved work. The Shaker held work in high esteem. All work was important, and it was important that all did physical work, including the leadership both to fulfill a commitment to the well-being of the community as a whole and as a way of individuals, for individuals to feel useful and worthy of community support. There was no concept of retirement other than for those who were challenged by health or age. And even the oldest shakers um, were accommodated and people found useful work for them as long as they were alive. The Shakers made an extraordinary effort to make participation in all aspects of their life possible for people with any type of disability. On that subject, they also provided health care that was probably more responsive to the individual needs than would have been possible in most families, as there were people whose designated job was to care for those who were ill. They believed in universal education. Most Shakers were literate, leaving us a wonderful record of diaries, journals, essays, correspondence, and songs. At the peak, there were 19 Shaker communities in New, in New England, New York, Ohio, and Kentucky. Each community was comprised of multiple communal family units. Jerry, so, I, Jerry I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to make sure, are, 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 we, are we still on the first slide? Yes. That's okay, fine. I apologize. Go ahead. Proselytizing was essential for Shakers to gain new members, and they did so by missionary efforts to place where there seemed to be an opening, where anywhere where there seemed to be an opening of spiritual activity. For example, they sent three missionaries to Ohio and Kentucky in 1805 because they had read accounts of the great Kentucky revival of those years. That was a very successful trip and they ended up forming um, eight Shaker communities in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. They published theological works and pamphlets which were widely distributed and they opened one of their worship meetings to the public every Sunday morning hoping that attendees who came out of curiosity would stay and learn more. They had some very powerful preachers. Their community began to dwindle in numbers during the last quarter of the 19th century, and today there remains only one active community. At Sabbath Day Lake, Maine, it has but two members, but is surrounded by a substantial faith community who, although not Shakers, find great benefit from worshiping with, the, with that church. They continue to proselytize, praying daily for an increase in new members, all that said, Shakers today are best known for their excellent products and contributions to the international design community derived from the particular style of furniture and household objects. That's as summary as I can get after 40 some years of this. People have learned not to ask me to tell them about the Shakers, but you could go to the next slide, Suzanne. Anyway, I just um, I wanted to get after that description, I just wanted to get a sense of what Shakers look like. This is a group of Shakers that the North County of Mount Lebanon, taken around 1903. By that time, heavily female in population, as men found other things to do in life other than be Shakers. Next one is fine. One of the things that um, we do in terms of one of our most interesting things that we do is to try to associate the, the hundreds and hundreds, actually thousands of historic photographs of the Shakers 
with the people who are pictured in them. So we make pretty great effort to do that kind of identification and make that available to people. We have a pretty good file of takers who had the photographs taken. There's, of course, many, many that we don't know who they are. But to try to take some of the anonymity out of just the phrase, they were a taker. We were actually make these into real people. And then from then on, to work on real stories about biography. So next. I just wanted to get a sense of, I mentioned all the Shaker communities. This is the community of Mount Lebanon. And I wanted to get a sense that these were also, these were agricultural rural communities. They were densely populated with buildings that would hold the number of people that would live in the Shaker family and, and shops for them to work in. Um, on the far left, you see a typical Shaker dwelling house and the buildings in front of it are workshops and um, farm buildings that are used by them. The buildings, the foreground is one family. And if you look at the original photographs, you could step back and see five of the eight families that existed at the Mount Lebanon community, arranged about a mile and a quarter down the road. So next slide. I mentioned the public meetings, and this is a photograph taken in 1871 of carriages belonging to people from the outside world coming to attend Shaker worship services. Um, the building in this, that is most in the foreground is the great dome roof meeting house at Mount Lebanon, built in 1824, and it still stands today. The museum owns that building, and it is on a long-term lease to a private school that uses it as a library. It's one of the treasured pieces of vernacular architecture in the state of New York, however. And I mentioned Shaker meeting. This is the interior of that building and Shaker worship service and a ring dance that is um, pictured by um, an artist named Joseph Becker, who visited the community sometime in the early 1870s and published this in Frank Leslie's magazine in 1873. This is sort of one of the iconic images of Shaker worship. And the, the, on the left hand side, the public is in bleachers provided for them so they could watch the service and be preached to. Next. I mentioned that the, while the Shakers proselytize a lot now, and even then, they became really better known for products that they took to market than they did for the religious beliefs. Um, and all through New England and up and down the eastern seaboard, Shaker merchants would take these boxes filled with garden seeds raised by the community, put up in little paper packages um, and distribute those to um, merchants up and, up and down along the seed route. And then they would do that in the spring and reclaim them in the fall, splitting the profits in a reasonable way with the people that sold them. So the shakers raised the vegetable seed, red, raised the vegetables, processed the seeds, packaged them and transported them for sale best known for seed, herbal medicine, and um, leather goods, tanning. Next. So what we know the Shakers best for in this century tends to be their furniture because they designed um, furniture that was would accommodate their desire to be without pride, without vanity, to be very simple and um, not to waste their time on unnecessary decoration in the objects that they lived with, both in their clothing and the food and the furnishing and other household items. Typical 1830s Shaker rocking chair. Next. Or tall case pieces like this. Simple stand. Still inspiring artists and designers at this time. Next. What I want to do is go through sort of, um, actually, before I do this, I want to talk a little bit about what we do in terms of genealogical work at the Shaker Museum. And I have to say, I said I've never done my own family tree. I've not done very much. Part of this is I'm an adopted person. So I don't, you know, what I know and what, uh, what DNA sampling I could do, you know, I don't want to know the answer to those questions. So. I've never had any reason. My parents told me wonderful stories about their parents and their grandparents, and I cherish those. And um, beyond that, I have a relatively small number of family members. Um, 
that I try to keep track of. So, but in terms of um, genealogical research, we get a lot of requests from people, and it sort of splits between people filling in blanks in the family tree when they stumble across somebody who at some point in their life was a faker, and people doing real family histories where they are looking for biographical information and want to tell stories. It's always been my favorite to work with those people because that's the kind of material that we have. Um, we don't have the shakers did not keep really good um, family tree records. Oftentimes, you would have two shakers with the last with the same last name. We didn't know whether they were actually related or not. Pretty hard to find out. I'd leave that up to folks like you. Should that ne be necessary to find out? But once we identify any given shaker and the um, documents the shakers left us, we can probably pinpoint people and lead them to the correct information that they can pursue and see if they can put together a story about that person. Some of those I'll share in just a minute. We do use, you know, basic sources, you know, the sort of find a grave ancestry, family search, and census records from time to time when we need to come up with that kind of information. But I am much more apt to call my friends who do genealogy, genealogy on a regular basis, one of those every night kind of projects for them than I am to try to delve into that myself. It's easier, I think. My first recommendation is one treat shaker genealogy as local history. And that I, by saying that, I mean that the people that are going to have the best information about family histories, about individual shakers, are going to be those people who work close to the communities where the shakers, that particular shaker lives. So if you had shakers who lived in part of New York and that part, that wonderful piece between the Hudson River and the Massachusetts line that probably should have been part of New England, but isn't. Um, you're going to want to talk to the local historians or the Shaker Museums in, the, in that area. So it would be me or the local historians or the County Historical Society. Because um, we probably have the most, the best records of um, the people who are members of those communities and have had reason to. Um, pull those records together and to actually do research in them. There's a lot of um, Shaker information that is available online. I think if you just search for Shaker or any particular given Shaker name of somebody who's well known, you will find um, information online. However, I have to caution you that a lot of the databases that I use on a daily basis to look up Shaker birth and death dates or where they lived at certain times or what their job was or sometimes even how tall somebody was or how much they weighed, um, end up being from proprietary databases that have been assembled by individual scholars who have taken it upon themselves to try to identify shakers from some given community or shakers of a certain time period. Um, those are generally not real easily available. I do say that there is one site that is called shakerpedia.com that has a number of resources on it. And one of those resources, um, excuse me, one of those resources is called Who Who Were They? And if you click on that, you will find um, a list of Shaker communities with databases of um, Shakers that were members of those particular communities. It is not the most robust database or the most robust amount of information that is located in the files, but it can assure you that that person, a particular person, was at least a member of the Shaker community, and then you can proceed from there. So let me talk a little bit about people who come and do research at the Shaker Museum and the kinds of information that they have look for and share. So the next one, there's a series of biographies that have been done over the years. There have been probably a half a dozen biographies written about Anne Lee. This is the latest of one done by Richard Francis. And They've really done a lot of investigation back in Manchester area and English records, um, trying to locate information about Anne Lee and her family. Um, and as of yet, no one, I think, no one has really nailed down exactly who this woman was. Um, we have lots of descriptions from the Shakers. We have their recollections published in a book that they did in 1816, sort of a uh, book of recollections done by first witnesses, those people who knew her person personally and I compare that it's written and presented very much like the, the books of the New Testament are and that they 
they told basically her lessons and um, relayed her teachings on and where they learned them and where they heard them first. But other than that, I do have to say, when asked to give a presentation on Mother Anne, as she was called, um, it's re I'm really hard pressed to think I can ever really nail down the subject perfectly. Next. But there are a number of other Shakers, and most of these, as I said, Shaker history is largely local history. This is a book about Richard McNamara, who was a Shaker brother at an Union Village in Waterloo, Ohio. Um, and this is done by somebody who is a, a passionate about local Ohio history. And she read through diaries and material about him. Next. And even more obscure, brother James Prescott was a Shaker in one of the same communities. Uh, this man took this on as his personal um, desire to um, personal desire to document the life of this particular shaker. I don't think he had any family relationship to him, just became fond of him for some reason. The next almost a uh, biography that got a lot of attention during the period when women's studies really blossomed and black studies really blossomed was a book written about Rebecca Jackson. She was a black shaker visionary who joined the community. She was originally a member of the Methodist AME Church, um, at the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and um, was a very spiritually charged woman who brought her community, small community into shaker order and was um, coached to join the shakers, but chose to remain a small out family of the shakers um, in her residence in Philadelphia. A book that this is a book that's gone through several reprintings and is um, very popular and still used in court work. Next, one of my fa favorite shakers of all time is actually a man named Dravani Mortimer Bennett. Bennett was a shaker. He joined as a young man and he was a shaker up until the mid 1840s when um, shakerism became a little bit um, more than what he wanted to endure, and he decided to leave. And when Bennett left, he took a young sister named Mary Wicks with him. They married, that raised a family. Bennett went on to become a publisher, a doctor, and then a publisher of a magazine called The Truth Seeker, which started publishing in, I believe, 17, 1879, and um, technically is continuing to this day, although the issue, um, issues are very sporadic. Um, the biography of Bennett is quite interesting as he was a real leader in the free thought movement in America, a champion of Thomas Paine and um, and well known through the world. Bennett was a, a curious person, a uh, an incredible writer who just published um, page after page after page of his opinions about things. Um, so following up on, there is actually a, a a documentary film on YouTube about Bennett, if you're interested. The next one. And having read about B.M. Bennett and um, his life, there was a woman, Ann Sayers, who decided she would look up Mary Wick. She ended up doing a biography of the Wicks family and their Shaker connections and their pre and post Shaker history. I should say that Shaker studies sort of in terms of Writing family histories organizes itself into sort of three parts. You have we have information about people's lives before they became shakers, and people were shakers were celibate and not, and um, people were not born into shakerism. There's um, there are most people have some little bit of life prior to their conversion to shakerism or being brought in with their family as a young child. There's the shaker life, which is usually pretty can be pretty well documented in shaker records. And then sometimes if they chose to leave as the Bennett is their post shaker life. And I'll talk more about that later. So next slide. There are writings done by apostate, writings that um, were done by people who chose to leave the shakers. Bennett didn't write much about the shakers after he left, but there are these writings I'm going to show you now are people who chose to write about shaker life after they left. So next. Probably one of the best known and most read books recently is The Great Divorce by Ilian Wu. Um, and I think this is probably the um, only take of biography that I know that has a chance of being sent to Hollywood and a movie being made about it. This is a woman, this is a book about a woman, Eunice Chapman, who she, her husband and children joined the Shakers and 
Eunice decided she no longer wanted to be a shaker and when ended up having to go through great trouble to obtain a divorce for her husband so she could remarry. It ended up being the first legislatively granted divorce in New York State. And so this is her story and um, it's recorded here by by Yolian Wu, but a lot of the writings are taken from Eunice's own writing. Next. And in the same vein, um, Beth DeWolf wrote a book called Taking the Faith, and this is a book about um, Mary Marshall Dyer, who wrote actually three or four books about her experience with the Shakers. Um, she, like um, Eunice Catman, joined with her husband and wanted to get possession of her children, um, who her husband demanded that they stay Shakers. Um, and this is the story of her fight and her publications and support from the outside world to get her children back. There are books that are actually people have taken and transcribed diaries of Shakers. Um, all of us have been tempted to the, the process of transcribing Shaker material so you can put it into a document or, or a database where you can actually search for things is very enticing. But I will tell you that there are, are well over a million pages of Shaker manuscript material and getting that material evenly distributed um, in electronic format is probably some years away until our machines can can read old writings as well as people can. Um, I think that I have a particular opinion about transcribed diaries and my problem with them is that those are the go-to um, low-hanging fruit for scholars so that they get overused in terms of people searching electronically for information. That information gets used more than it does for the hard work of having to go through handwritten diaries. But I still enjoy them and I still use them and I'm glad that people did the work. So next slide. This was a project done by a woman, Susan Menard, who had a particular affection to a Shaker brother um, named Irving Greenwood, who lived at the Canterbury Shaker community. And she luckily took um, Irving kept diaries um, through the from 1894 to 1939 when he died. And the good thing about that is we have very slight records. The Shakers dwindled in numbers and ended up not keeping as good a records as they did in the 18th in the 18th and 19th century as they um, as they went forward into the 20th century. So um, this is a great piece for people who want to know what Shakerism was about in um, the early part of the last century. Next. And this monumental work um, funded and sort of um, shepherded along by Peter Vandermark. Vandermark is, um, he found that he was related to Shakers with the name of Crossman and the Crossman's related to the bishop. And so he took on Elder Rufus Bishop was a major player in the Shaker ministry at Mount Lebanon, and in fact in charge of the entire Shaker church. And what he decided was to try to transcribe all of Elder Rufus's writings that he could locate. So this is a two volume set, a third volume, possibly a fourth, are soon coming out. And at some point, this will be made available electronically. Right now, it's only in print. But, um, a very useful book, especially for the history of the Mount Lebanon community and the, and the 2,400 Shakers who lived there at one point or another. Next, on sort of a slightly different note, some scholars have found caches mm -hmm. and materials that um, they found particularly interesting. Cool. This is a collection of 20 some letters written by a man, a young man who just converted to Shakerism, writing back to his parents. Um, about his experience about becoming a taker and living at Pleasant Hill in the form of correspondence. And I think there'll be, there are a number of these books out where people find a little cache of documents that make a good story and then get being published. Steve Stein, who is a tremendous scholar on the Shakers, is sort of the person responsible for the most um, recent general history of the Shakers. Shakers also wrote autobiographies. Um, some of these are in manuscript form, but some of them over the years got published. So next slide. A man named Kirby Elkin spent 50 years, 15 years among the Shakers in northern New Hampshire at the community of Enfield. He was a very well educated person. He writes incredibly well, very perceptive, and really is a major source of people want to know what life was like in 
um, the state community there. He mentions a lot of people who were his um, cohorts in that community. And next slide. And just this year, a book came out called Beach Hill, which is a result of one woman, Galen Beale's research into the Elkins family. She um, located at an antique dealer a cache of two trunks full of correspondence that Elkins and his family wrote back and forth about his Shaker experience and his post Shaker experience as well. And she condensed that into a book about the Elkins family and his relationship with the Shakers. Next. Baker brother George Wickersham was um, an interesting character. He originally, he and his family originally joined a commune just north of Philadelphia called, oh, I'm blanking on the name, um, the Valley Forge community. And when that community started to break up, a number of those people joined the Shakers at Mount Lebanon. And Wickersham writes an account of how he came to be a Shaker, which was often reprinted and distributed. And it's a, it's a good short read. All of you know, 15 pages. Next class, next slide. And probably one of the best known shakers ever, um, a man named Frederick William Evans, is a, the elder of the North family at Mount Lebanon and was the elder of that family for a period of 50 years. He wrote extensively to newspapers, magazines, and lectured widely on the Shakers, became involved with the spiritualists and was carted around by the spiritualists to lecture on the Shakers' experience with the spirit world. Um, he was taken to England on two separate trips in 1871 and 1876. Um, he saw those as proselytizing opportunities and he was used there to lecture heavily in England about the Shakers, successful in making a few converts. So next slide. He wrote, this is um, Elder Frederick. I just want to point out that he's holding a cane in his hand. Elder Frederick, um, and the next slide. And I mentioned that we like to tell stories. So when we can associate objects in our collection with particular shakers, we have a number of photographs of Evan. He was often photographed. Um, and in the last 10 years, we acquired this cane that another Shaker brother had carved for Elder Evans to use. I mentioned Shakers, even the leadership work. Um, Frederick Evans was a gardener um, when he wasn't being an elder and taking care of that business. Um, he was often found in the garden, in the, either the vegetable garden or the seed garden. And there's a terrifying account where he stuck a um, garden fork through his, into his leg as he was um, loosening soil one day. And we don't know if this is exactly the fork, but this one has his name on it. So that's the story we'll tell and we'll stick with it for a while. Next slide. And this is um, Elder Frederick seated among the Shakers of the North family. This is this photograph was taken the year before he died. So um, in um, 1792, this photograph was taken, quite elderly. And the next slide. And it brings up the idea of a memorial. So next slide, the Shakers wrote memorials of some of their best known and departed um, brothers and sisters. This is a memorial published for Elder, published, written about and published for Elder Frederick in 1893, the year, the year after he died. The next slide, effectively inscribed. And these are usually accounts by other people written of their recollections and memories, and may also contain some of his own writing. Next slide. Elder Dana White, Elder Daniel Offord were the elder and elders that took over after Frederick died, and um, again, very beloved Shaker members. Next slide. So Elder Dana White, Anna White, you people mentioned the Quakers. Anna White was the daughter of a Quaker from New Jersey, a man named Robert White, who never joined the Shakers officially full time himself, but became a great friend of the Shakers, both in giving, supporting them financially and often sending them food and publishing books for them and sending his daughter to them. He became one of the great Shaker leaders and Shaker historians. Next, for Elder Dorothy Jurgen, who was one of the saints of the Canterbury community in New Hampshire. Henry Glenn, who was probably one of my 
my favorite takers of the Canterbury community. Um, my wife and I are letterpress printers. We, um, we like old presses and lead type and printer's ink and Frederick and I'm um, sorry, Elder Henry was a printer and I'm working on a story and, and history of his printing with Jacob printing. So if you're interested in his information, what he has to offer in his various publications and his biographies. I'd like to tell you just two quick stories before we wrap up into questions here next. I mentioned that um, that I don't do a lot of genealogy work, but I was really intrigued. This um, this implement, which is a post auger used in drilling out round, round holes, would be turned into rectangular holes or square holes or mortises or mortise and tendon timber frame buildings. Um, is one that was came from the Shaker community at Mount Lebanon. And next slide. And on the side of it, and you can go right to the next slide. I found that the, the initials RW and the date 1851. Of course, when I see something like that, I go immediately to Shaker journals and diaries. And I was able to find that in 1851, a Shaker brother named Richard Woodrow built a post auger for timber framing building. So it made me do some investigations of Richard Woodrow. And what I found was that he joined the Shakers with his mother. Either his father had died and she was left alone or the father had left, it was never quite clear. And um, so his mother and, and three-year-old Richard joined the Shakers. He was raised by them, trained as a mechanic and a woodworker and a metal worker, and um, put in charge of framing a brand new barn that was to be raised in 1853. So in, um, this barn was about 200 feet long and 50 feet wide, three stories high at its highest point. And Richard was put in charge of um, of um, framing up the barn, getting the frame ready to do. So Richard was in his mid 20s by the time this all happened, decided that he would have a better life outside the Czech community and parted with them in 1852 before he raised the barn. In fact, the barn, the Czechs had to wait for a while to figure out how to put all the pieces together that he had um, framed up and, and got ready for raising. But they eventually did raise the barn that lasted till about 1912 when it was burned. Um, anyway, it made me think that Richard Woodrow is a pretty clever guy and there must be some trace of him. So in my rudimentary efforts to track him down, um, I did find that he ended up living in Philadelphia, um, worked as a cabinet maker and a house carpenter for a while, eventually opened a hardware store and for some reason was buried someplace in, oh, did marry, um, had children, and um, at some point was buried in New Jersey. So I learned something about him, and as I said, very rudimentary genealogical skills, but I should probably turn the story over to one of you and see if we couldn't flesh that out a little bit. Next slide. And I have to admit that back in the 1980s, I wrote a book about Shaker furniture makers, and I took largely a biographical approach on trying to describe um, those men who made, who were responsible for making this furniture that everybody was so interested in. I thought something about their life, where they learned, how they taught each other, um, what other kinds of things they were involved in, led me to write a book about 30 some have people that I could identify as cabinet makers. Some of the stories are much longer and much better than others, but I wanted to cover, I was actually asked to cover the full gamut of Shaker communities from the east to the west. So some of the stories are short and could be filled out now 40 years later. But I want to draw your attention to the man pictured on the on the right hand side. Next slide. One of the pieces of furniture that was given to me or suggested that I Got a document with this desk that came from the community, Shaker Community at Harvard, Massachusetts. The simple desk made by, and it signed on the bottle, bottom of it was made by a brother, Shaker brother named Alfred Collier. And in doing some basic research, Alfred Collier left two very, um, very full and informative diaries in his time with the Shakers. Um, but he too left the Shakers, and what happened to him afterwards is a little bit less well known. But in trying to do that research, and again, 
falling into my um, inadequate genealogy mode, I did stumble across the Collier family genealogy. And in that, next slide, I found that there was a reproduction of a daguerreotype of Alfred Collier and his nephew Henry, who he had brought into the Shakers, um, taken before they were um, had left the Shakers. And the issue with this is that Collier had family in, in Charleston, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, and it was basically in Boston. And he would go there on a pretty regular basis to visit his family. And on the pretense that he was to bring young Henry and other members of his family into the faith. Um, apparently, while he was there, he had his photograph taken several times. There are a couple of them in the book. This is the only one done in Shaker garb. And luckily, the family held on to the photograph because in 1873, the Shakers, who were starting to have their photographs and portraits taken, um, were concerned that in a community where everybody should share equally that the cost of maintaining the new hobby of taking photographs would be too expensive for them. So in a, a communal society, we share equally. If I have my photograph taken, I give um, one person a copy of my photograph. Everyone should have their photograph taken and give everybody a copy of the photograph. And you start ringing up the cost of that, plus the album, plus the frame, plus whatever else costs. The ministry said, no more portraits are going to be taken in our community. And all the portraits that have been taken so far to be turned into the leadership and destroyed. There are very few shaker photographs of shakers prior to 1870, about 1873 or 1871. They did allow photographs that had been taken of shakers in scenery, small pictures of shakers, like the one of like the picture of shakers in front of the meeting house. Um, those do exist because they were selling those in their gift shop as a way of getting some income when people visitors came. But portraits were definitely banned and there are, I would say, probably fewer than a dozen um, portraits left. So finding the Collier photograph was a huge breakthrough and getting a really early photograph of Shaker in full costume. Next slide. And as I wrap up, people continue to take photographs of Shakers. We continue to document people. Sister Mildred Barker, um, one of my favorite Shaker sisters, long departed now, um, was a it was always my favorite slide in and a presentation to as she waved to the photographer on her way from the dwelling house to her office. And the next slide. I'll leave this up for a little while. That's my email address. If you have Shaker questions, want specific information on you stumble across somebody who's a shaker, who might have been a shaker, or lives in a shaker community, or lives near a shaker community and wanted to find out. I do have access to a lot of databases that are not available to the public, and I'm very happy to look them up. My worst nightmare is um, all my friends who are. My friends who are. Um, Antique dealers and collectors who send me sets of initials and want to know what who they belong to. That's a much harder search than when I have a full name. But um, if you stumble across somebody and you're interested in pursuing it, um, I am. That's one of the things I do here. Part of my job, so I'm happy to do it. And the last slide, I hope. I'm sorry, did you say there was a one more slide after this? Sure, just you can leave that up, but you can go back to Sister Mildred. Okay, I'll leave it up then. Um, I have a couple of questions based on what you said. You just happened to mention on that 1970s photo that uh, this was kind of like a tourist attraction. It, it, was that like recent or has that been in place for a long time? Um, <clears throat> since the Shakers, well, it, it, it depends a little bit. Since the Shakers, <clears throat> were well known by um, by 1800 for their peculiar form of worship. If the Shaker community was near a place where people would go, for example, in New Lebanon, New York, where the Shaker, the Mount Lebanon community was, just up the road, um, a couple of miles or so is Lebanon Springs, which is a series of hotels where by the 1820s and earlier, people were coming to take the spring water for their health. 
and come they would come there for a month or so in the summer and come Sunday instead of going to church they go see the Shaker show it was more entertaining and yet you know met their religious obligations they felt so if the Shaker communities were located somewhere where they would get a crowd of people there for some other reason um, oftentimes their meeting houses were overwhelmed with visitors on Sunday they saw this as a bonus in fact in 1821, the Shakers had so many people coming to their small meeting house uh, that they found that people were trying to crawl in the windows and would just wander around in places they didn't belong. And so they built a much larger meeting house that I showed you the picture of. And even with that meeting house, they said that sometimes they would have 2,000 visitors in attendance at a given, on a given Sunday morning. It's a very little room for the Shakers. Now that that's really amazing. Now you said you mentioned Mount Lebanon, but were there other communities? And in terms of that they visited? No, that that where the Shakers lived in and worshipped. Yes, I just yes, there are 19 Shaker communities. There were two in Maine, one of which is still active. There were two in New Hampshire, four in Massachusetts, one in Connecticut, um, two in three in New York, five in um Ohio, two in Kentucky, and one in Indiana. And how are they des how are they designated on the census? How would you identify if your if well, your ancestor was a shaker? One of the challenges is in the later censuses, they the word shaker may appear, um, but in the early censuses, the shakers would be enumerated by the name of the elder in the family. So it would be. Um, Elder Josiah Talcott's family, and what you would find is maybe 30 Shakers listed, um, all of whom seem to have the same basic address or listed in a row. But you need to know that in 1790, or I'm sorry, in 1810, that Josiah Talcott was the elder of the Shaker family in order to know that the next 30 people were Shakers. So I, I think after the Civil War, the censuses get to be easier to deal with. I don't do a lot of work with those because um, I don't. I have other <laughs> things to do. But, um, that's, the, that's one of the challenges. Is there, a, to your knowledge, is there like a map identifying the, the, where the communities were you know, scattered across the states? Yeah, I, I can send you, it usually gets published in the in, Every book that gets published about shakers and shaker furniture, usually somebody will put an obligatory map with a location of community. Great. That'd be, I'd love to share that and with the students. I can think I'm writing down things. List of communities. Okay. Now, um, you mentioned that Anna White had started off as a Quaker and then become a shaker. Yeah. Uh, was that common for Quakers to convert over to shakers? Very unusual. I, I don't know of many, I can't actually think of another Quaker who became a Quaker. Okay, and was there any common belief system between the Quakers and the Shakers? Um, that you could be personally moved to um, speak from the spirit. It, you know, Quakers would sit in, sit in meeting until they felt moved by the spirit to share something. Quaker, Shakers did the same thing. If you go to Shaker meetings today, um, Brother Arnold, who will lead the meeting, will start off with usually with a song, which is in a hymnal, um, and so you can you can sing along with that. And then um, he will he will have usually an Old Testament, New Testament, and a gospel reading for the day. And then he will welcome people. Um, he will have a second song from the hymnal, and then he'll welcome people saying their founder, Mother Ann, um, always. Said, welcome to welcome people to meeting and said that their founder mother and said that there never is a stranger, so never feel strange or stranger. You are free to participate in song or testimony as you felt led to. And then they will start, and usually he starts by giving some kind of reflection on the on the uh, either reflection on the gospel or on one of the Bible readings or something that's just been on his mind or something he feels led by the spirit to share with people and then usually every personal testimony or comment by anyone is followed by a song which is usually not in the hymnal so if you know the song you sing along if you don't 
you sit there and learn these songs. The Shakers have a repertoire of about 10,000 songs, so um, you never know all of them, um, and they don't use all of them. But um, and then Shaker meeting, which will last probably about an hour, is just people, depending on how many people are in the meeting. But with 30 or 40 people, it may last an hour, and people will either get up and say what they want to say, and then that'll be followed by a song, and that just continues until um, the leader of the meeting feels like the meeting is over, and he'll say the meeting is over, and people get up and leave. And that's it. Actually, these days, they, they end with the Lord's Prayer, or the Our Father, depending on what church you go to. Um, um, Con Connie put into the chat box, she'd like to ask, does your library do interlibrary loans? Um, we don't, but there are tons of Shaker books online. So I have a pretty good list of original primary source material online. Um, secondary source material, it's, um, there's so many books published on the Shakers and so many that have been out there for a while that I find that um, it's, probably cheaper to buy something on eBay than it is to have it sent to me by interlibrary loan. But anyway, um, I, I live in the state, so I don't have, I do have interlibrary loan, but it's a, sort of a challenge. Um, anyway, there's, we don't do interlibrary loan. If it's short material, um, I do a fair amount of scanning and sending people material. Excellent. Um, I want to let the class know if you don't want to uh, type a, a question into the chat box, please turn on your microphone, leave your camera off, but turn on your microphone and ask Jerry directly. And while I'm waiting for that, Jerry, I have a, gosh, this is so interesting. I have a couple of questions. Um, were they living communally? I noticed that the, the buildings that you showed us were very large and they looked like basically like communal living. Yeah, absolutely. So Shaker dwelling houses would have someplace between 30 and 70 people living in them. And they were they were occupied. I don't like the comparison of the Catholic Church, particularly because the theology is so, so different, but it's sort of like a convent and a number, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a convent and a monastery stuck together in one building. So men would occupy one half of the building and across the hall would be the Shaker women. Um, each building was set up with two separate sets of staircases, so they did not have to pass each other on the stairs. They were not to have physical contact or to really talk to each other alone. If they were had to have a conversation with um, between a man and a woman, they were supposed to do it with another person present. Um, there was a lot of effort, and if you look at those sacred buildings, there's a huge number of windows. It was really hard to get away with much in Shaker community. There was a lot of people looking out windows to see what was going on. Now, I have seen, I, I think one of the things that started my interest so much in this is I saw some videos on YouTube of Shaker um, ceremonies. And there was like a unique form of, I don't want to say the word dancing, but perhaps it might be referred to as dancing. Can you yeah. kind of go over that? Um, in the earliest days, the Shakers just did like the Quakers of old did, was this, this ecstatic movement. It may involve jumping or rolling on the floor or barking like a dog or just arms flaring up in the air, or your neck twisting back and forth quickly. But by 18, by um, 1790 to mid 1790s, the Shaker leader at the time, who was an old Baptist minister, converted to Shakerism, imposed a very strict order on how the dance was done, basically how Shaker life was lived. And at that point, he developed a dance called the Square Order Shuffle, where ranks people were in ranks, much like um, basic training drill with soldiers, men facing women, and they would do a simple dance. It was three steps forward, tap your foot, three steps back tap your foot and then shuffle in place, right leg, left leg, right leg, left leg. And they would repeat that during um, all of the, the length of the song, which is usually sung by a separate group of singers off to the side. That evolved into a whole bunch of different forms of dance to the one that you saw in the one illustration of the circle dance where men and women were in um, concentric circles passing each other in opposite directions as the music went on. The Shakers used no instrumental music, all of it was a cappella. They did not sing in harmony until the 1870s. 
So they're very simple to, to learn. Oh, um, and um, they made great efforts to have people learn enough music to carry on through the services. They would have music meetings in the evening to learn songs and laboring meetings in which they learned the new dances that might be introduced. They wanted the performance in public to be very precise and impressive. So they made an effort to do that. I see, okay. Now, um, were there any, uh, it sounds like since these were communities, were there any like surnames that appear, you know, in these communities like over decades? Um, there are surnames that appear in, um, I guess what's good to understand is that a lot of the Shakers came, a lot of the Shakers in this area came, for example, I'll give you the example, in the New Lebanon area, came to the frontier, which this was at the time, out of Connecticut. And so a lot of them were old Connecticut families who decided to reject the established church and go off and join one of the New Light religious groups. The Shakers were one of those groups that, that they could join. So when they came up here, they often moved up as whole families. So even though um, even though the Shakers lived separately, husbands and wives basically had nothing to do with them with each other once they joined. Their children were raised by caretakers rather than by their moms and dads. Um, they would live communally. They may see each other, but they did not have that parental child parent role or husband wife role at all any longer. Um, in fact, if you wanted to join the Shakers after the first initial influx of members, um, you had to be separated in marriage, you had to settle your financial affairs, and you had to make a decision about what your children were going to do if they were going to join or stay with other relatives. You couldn't, you really couldn't join the Shakers without um, clearing up your life and be able to live a Shaker life without complexity. So with oh, husband, so with, with... Actually, to answer your question, a lot of Shakers were, were actually related to each other by blood or by marriage, previous ma marriage, previous to the Shaker experience. There are a lot of Shakers named Bishop, a lot of Shakers named Talcott, a lot of Shakers named Young and Wells, and all of them came out of either Connecticut or Long Island. Um, in this area, um, many of them are father, son, you know, grandchild, sometimes, you know, cousin. Um, once you do the, the, the sort of family tree, but I don't think people have spent a lot of time doing it because the Shakers didn't document those relationships very well. Um, on occasion, it was necessary to do it, but oftentimes it, it just didn't happen. Let me tell you a really brief story. There were four Shakers who, a family of Shakers, the Wells who joined the Shakers as a community just north of Albany, New York, named Waterfleet, New York. Um, all four of them, by the time they got to be age 80, were still alive, and all four of them were in leadership positions. Three of them got together and suggested to their brother, three guest wells, that they all sit down to dinner together as a family as they hadn't done it since they were children. Three guests said, no, I'm not going to participate. We are not supposed to be in the family mode about that. So after, you know, in a position where we had the authority to do it, in a position where they hadn't done it since they were children, they were coming close upon their um, their transition to the spirit world. Um, one of the one of the children even called out and said, "No, I'm not going to recognize the, our biological family relationship." So some were very strict about it. Sometimes you see a little break in it where um, a mother is allowed to visit her children, or children is allowed to visit their mother. There must have been something going on. But, cause the shakers to bring somebody down to have a visit. So since they were living communally and the women lived on one half and the men lived in the other half and the children were, were raised by caretakers, were the children raised in the same building as the mother and the father? Usually not, usually in a separate building. So you would uh, find the children on say, a- so Until you would, they reached the age of about 15, which case um, they would generally move in with the adult. I see. So would you find the children on the census at the same address or would it be a different address than their parents? Probably the same address. Okay. Yeah, because the, the, the census takers, the best I can understand, would go to the shakers, they'd go to the office, the office would, whoever was pending the office would 
assign them to the shaker elder in charge of the family, that person would present a list of their members. So not every shaker family, most of the shaker children were housed in the, the family that's usually called either the church family or the center family. That was the family where the meeting house was. So other shaker families did not necessarily have children living with them in the early days. By the 1860s or 70s, most every Shaker family would have had some children living there. But in the early pre-Civil War Shakers, generally the children lived in only one family. I and see. that's where the school was located, so they'd be educated there as well. Excellent. Okay, well, that's really interesting. Um, you see, obviously, because of your bio that, that you provided the class, you, you've been you know, working in with this subject area for many decades. Um, how did you first get interested in Shaker? Is there a family connection? Um, no. <laughs> I, um, I realized after I got started that I actually taught a unit on um, an American history class that mentioned communal societies. And I had a, I found an old mimeograph piece that I'd done that had a paragraph about the Shakers on it. That's from 1969 or 70, probably 70. Um, but other than that, I was, um, I, I graduated from school with a secondary school teaching degree, but I really had not enjoyed the classroom. I'm a child of the 60s. Um, I was really more interested in American social history than I was in political history. I did a lot of reading about religious, religious history and got involved in the transcendentalist. I moved out east from the Midwest and um, got involved with a group of people. We ran a halfway house for three adolescent children that we ran as a small commune. And I started reading about American historic communes in order to understand how we should run our community um, and stumbled across the Shakers. And I also had done some hobby woodworking as a young man, because my dad was, I would say my dad was a college professor and he could never afford to buy new furniture. So he always bought old furniture and fixed it. So I had a woodworking shop to play in. And so I did some woodworking, found out the Shakers made furniture, and I got interested in making Shaker objects and got interested in their communal life and just started reading. And I will tell you, if nobody who's on this um, presentation gets caught up in the Shakers at some point in their life, I'll be surprised. They're very, um, one of the things that I found most interesting about the Shakers is that no matter what you're interested in, there's an avenue for getting involved with some aspect of shaper life, whether it's cooking or craft or um, religion or whatever it is, medicine. I have people all over that just take on little pieces of the shaker experience and have dedicated years of study to it. So beware, it's seductive. And I just kind of want to point out to the class that we do have some books here in our library on the shakers. Uh, we have, uh, I think, at least one or two in our genealogy room, and I think we have several other out in our general collection, uh, especially regarding their furniture uh, and and um, uh, the appreciation of, of the furniture as well. Um, it, it, I looked through the books a couple weeks ago, and, and they're really, really interesting. So if you're interested in that topic, uh, like Jerry said, uh, this is something that um, you might very well want to read and actually take up as an interest. So the other, thing, the other thing I might mention is there are a couple of people who are very connected to the Shaker world that are, in fact, um, serious genealogists, and they keep trying to contribute Shaker material to, um, to the basic websites. I know that stuff keeps popping up on Find a Grave where people have photographs of individual Shakers that are trying to contribute either, you know, their grave sites or photographs of Shakers that they know that have not previously shown up on those sites. I, would be tempted to do it myself, except I find I run out of time and my technological abilities as you have seen are limited. So. Well, are, are, are there Shaker uh, cemeteries? Um, I know with the Quakers, you know, they have a lot of unmarked graves. Shakers in the early days marked their graves with a simple stone and sometimes their initials. Later, they put their full names and date of death, birth and death. Um, and then in the 1920s and 30s, they decided that the maintain, maintenance of Shaker cemeteries as communities closed was going to be a real burden to them. So at, in 
there are still shaker cemeteries that have individual stones. So one at just outside the Albany Airport at the Guadalupe community has about 400 graves and it's all marked on similar pieces of mar marble. And that's where the shaker founder Ann Lee is buried. Um, people often visit there, but many shaker cemeteries had the stones removed and a single marker put up that just says shaker and the dates that the community was open. That's true at the two cemeteries at Mount Lebanon, one in Maine, two in Maine, um, two in New Hampshire, one in New Hampshire, one in Connecticut, and several other places in, in the West. Some have just been plowed under by farmers over the years because the shaker took the stones up. And I would assume that the, the uh, philosophy behind that would be the focus is on the community and not on the individual? Yes. I a, friend, see. a friend of mine in the Shaker world, when 9-11 happened and they were looking for a memorial, thought the Shaker model was, you know, you can still find out, there's still accounting about the who's buried in the cemetery, even without a marker, but he thought it would be fitting to have a single marker because that was the shared experience that went on there. But people need a place to go and a place to know where there's a marker in their name, which the Shakers found to be true, too. There was objection to them taking down markers. I see. That's fascinating. Okay. Well, class, I'm, I see a lot of you are still logged in. Uh, do you have any questions for our guest speaker? Okay, Jerry, it sounds like all their questions have been answered. Uh, and this was, this was really fascinating to me. And I really appreciate your time. And, and we very much appreciate you letting us record. And we will get this edited and put up on our YouTube channel. And uh, we really appreciate it. So uh, with that, I'll let the class know that we've still got about another hour, hour and a half left of our open lab. So we are all welcome to stay. If you would uh, like to leave at this point in time, all you gotta do is click on the red, uh, or yes, the red stop button and that'll take you out. So with that, Jerry, I'll say thank you once again. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. Great, nice to almost meet you all. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. If you're out this way, look us up. Okay. Will do. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.